This is Hannibal here from thehannibaltv.com. And joining me today is the more reliable half of the former WWE superstar Dick's tag team. And he's also a four-time Ohio Valley Wrestling tag team champion. Tank Toland, how are you doing today? Hey, hey. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me on, man. You're looking as jacked as ever. Are you still wrestling? Uh, you know, I have some uh, shows that I'm lining up uh, soon and, uh, you know, just working on that. Uh, so I had took some time off wrestling, um, you know, spend time with the daughter and, uh, you know, a couple other things uh, as far as my ventures and stuff that I've been working on. But, uh, yeah, man, I'm, I've been taking care of myself, uh, making sure that I'm ready to go at any time that I need to, you know, get in that ring. So, yeah. And you got the purple hair going. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, it's actually the computer. I don't know why. Oh. Anything that, yeah, I know. Right. Isn't that crazy? Look at that. Yeah. It looks purple, right? I don't know. Yeah. I thought, but you know what? I, I'm actually kind of liking it. Maybe I might go with that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a new gimmick. Yeah. So, so what sports did you play before wrestling? Obviously you were a bodybuilder. You had that uh, massive physique, right. uh, but what was your uh, athletic background like? Um, you know, I did a lot of, um, played baseball, football, wrestling, uh, through my early years up through grade school, high school. And then, uh, yeah, didn't do anything like that in college. I was focusing more on my studies, uh, just did intramural stuff there, but I, you know, always started working out when I was like 11, 12 years old, I knew I wasn't going to be the tallest guy. So I wanted to try and be the widest, uh, if that was possible. So, um, so yeah, so basically bodybuilding was always a, a part of my life from the time I was a little kid uh, watching guys like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then of course Hulk Hogan, which was one of my big influences as far as wanting to, you know, pursue wrestling and, you know, live that dream. So, so yeah, so I've been very uh, active throughout my life and then, you know, dabbling in, uh, you know, stuff like, you know, mis mixed martial arts, uh, boxing, things like that as well. Did you ever end up having any uh, MMA matches? No, I didn't actually do it for uh, getting in the ring. I, you know, I think this this face is just too pretty to get punched, to be quite honest. But uh, no, I just trust me, I'll be plenty self-deprecating soon enough. But but yeah, no, I, I just it was more so for just because I had a passion uh, in the sport. I liked watching it and it was, you know, it's it's an incredible workout and uh, it uh, takes a lot of uh, dedication. And uh, and it's just something I really wanted to dive into because it was fun. So that's the, that's the main reasons I did it for, for, you know, just, uh, the pride, uh, how, how much joy I found in it and also just to get good exercise in. Now I know you were discovered by WWE through an Ohio Valley wrestling open tryout camp, which this was the days before, uh, NXT and that they would actually do these monthly or bi-monthly group tryouts where they would, fly all these people out ECW and WCW had just closed down. So there was lots of talent mm -hmm. and it was a lot harder to get in the business. So how long had you been wrestling before this camp and what made you want to apply for it? Um, I first joined the um, monster factory actually is where I got my start. Um, I mean, I had been watching wrestling and practicing the moves uh, on my little brother since I was a, a little guy. Uh, and then, you know, did it through high school and college as far as just practice and stuff, watching TV and rewinding the tape, the VCR tape until it wouldn't work anymore, just practicing the moves and all that stuff. But uh, being formally trained, uh, it wasn't until um, I think it was like October of 2000. Um, I started at the the Monster Factory. It's, uh, it was the closest place to me when I graduated college uh, with my teaching degree. I thought, you know, I want to be able to. Uh, you know, do this as a hobby, possibly, um, you know, at the time I didn't know, you know, if it was even possible to make it to the, to the top, even though it was my dream. Uh, but I found whatever, you know, place was legitimate and close enough to me uh, to train. And it just so happened one of the best places that you can go was the Monster Factory 20 minutes away from where I lived. So I was teaching during the week and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I was going and training at night and the weekends uh, wrestling. So that's when I got my start. Who was running the Monster Factory at that point? I know it's under fairly 
new management over the past five or so years. I think they have a have a new show coming out on Apple TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Danny, uh, I'm I'm happy for uh, for for Danny, uh, who's you know running the show now. There, um, Danny Cage. Uh, you know, he's he's doing a great job picking up you know and keeping that that Monster Factory name going, which is it's awesome. I'm really happy that it's uh, you know survived and now thriving in uh, you know a business where it could be you know really up and down and uh, a lot of places don't last and you know just to show that the monster factory is still there and and it's it's doing well that's it's it's awesome to see and it's a testament to to how well uh, Danny's doing and carrying on the, the monster factory name and and uh, pretty boy Larry Sharp's uh, dream so. Um, when I was there to answer your question, um, pretty boy, Larry Sharp is the one that, uh, gave me the tryout and, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was one of those tryouts where you go in there, he says, okay, run the ropes and we're going to do this, that, and the other did a few simple little things. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's like, eh. he goes, I think you got something kid. I think you got something. I, I want to, I want to give you a shot here, but, you know, of course, you know, you know, come to find, you know, pretty much anyone that is willing to you know, pay the money to, to go and train was going to be accepted. Uh, not, not to say that that was bad on him. That's he, he's a businessman. He wants to make money and that's how you make money. You get people in the door and you train them and not to say, you don't know who's going to pan out and who's not, you know, someone might start off the greenest drizzling piece of shit there is. And, you know, might, you know, become something you just don't know. So, uh, so yeah, that's how I got my start. And the, uh, main trainer there at the time was a guy named Ed Seeley, who was, a uh, I think he was from Manitoba, uh, Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he was, a, I think he went by Ed the Razor, Ed Atlas, uh, up there. And I don't know. Uh, but he was one of the guys that uh, was uh, training me at the time. And um, it was very interesting. He's a very interesting guy and uh, a character, which you run into a lot of those in, in the wrestling business. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. Now, at that Ohio Valley Wrestling tryout, I was actually there too, uh, but I had only had about seven matches at that time. And I remember seeing you, and there was about three or four other guys out of the 50 that were seasoned and, and looked like they had the part. And there were some others, like I think Chad Gaspard may have been there. Yeah, you know – um, uh, I'd say the most seasoned person that was there was actually um, was uh, Chris. Uh, I mean, Christopher Daniels, uh, you know, obviously he'd been around for a long time. Didn't really need to do a, a training camp per se. I think he was just trying to get, get a look to, you know, get his foot in the door and, and you know, maybe get a shot with the WWE. Um, Cause I know he hadn't, for some reason he was, he got the cold shoulder many times, um, even though he's, he was a phenomenal talent. Um, but yeah, he was there, uh, myself, um, which I barely scraped in because I didn't know that my, uh, submission and my application hadn't gotten there. Um, and I called the, the, I called OVW saying, Hey, just want to check on my, my application. And they're like, Oh, we never received it. And so I was like, Oh my gosh, it's like two days before, you know, uh, I think the deadline was like actually a couple hours. And I said, if I send it in now, will you guys take a look at it? They said, yeah. And luckily enough, uh, I think it was like, I think like over, I think, well over a thousand people, I think, um, applied. And I think they took what, like 50, I think. Uh, so it was myself, uh, Shad was there, um, you know, the beast. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Julian Hall was there. Mike Mondo was there. Um, shoot. Uh, man, so many, so many. Bradshaw was also there too. I remember he was, he was already there, but he was like watching. And I remember him. Said he wanted to see some potatoes and stuff on the side. Well, I mean, classic, classic Bradshaw, you know, stirring shit and, and, uh, you know, doing what he does best, you know, talking shit, stirring shit, you know, anything that has to do with shit, he's involved. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I remember he was there and, uh, you know, Ron Simmons was there at the time. I remember he was, they were there for, they were there again uh, when I was actually in OVW working shows because I had a little, a little uh, thing with them um, uh, in the back of a ring truck, which was, you know, part of the ribbon. But it was it was fun and it was uh, a good a good memory, even though it wasn't uh, it was at my expense. But yeah. Okay, so I get well. Before we get into that, how did the process go to actually 
get hired because that tryout camp, I remember it wasn't necessarily to get hired, but it was to be non-contract in OVW. Were you, were you hired straight out of that or did you have to go non-contract for a while? Um, you know, it was, it was really, uh, it was, I wasn't hired right away. No one was, um, you're right. It was, you know, to, it was basically to get the shot to, to come up to OVW, get trained by, um, you know, Rip Rogers and the, and be in the contract class, which, um, you know, I think they took out of the 50 people, I think they took like 10 of us. Um, and, uh, it was, it was, it was great. I mean, we got to go and train with the contract people that were already up there and uh it took me i think i think i got the contract about i got there derby weekend like may 3rd and um i i had a contract by october so i mean i was very fortunate very lucky uh to a get called uh by jim cornett i mean that was i still remember the call phone call to this day i was i was uh I, I, you know, my phone rang, I picked up and, and he just said, Hey, Hey tank, it's uh Jim Cornette here. I uh, just, uh, wanted to, wanted to ask you if you, uh, were interested, come to OVW and work towards a, a WWE contract. I said, I said, yeah, absolutely. So he said, uh, he, I said, he said, how soon can you get here? I said, how soon do you need me? And, uh, you know, basically, you know, that was, I remember that was like towards the end of April, make the first weekend of May I was there. Um, packed my stuff up and got right down there because I wasn't going to mess around and uh, miss any chances. And, and not to mention, I was just so excited. I would have, if he said come today, I would have left. I would have left right there. I would have left five minutes before the phone call. So yeah. Who were some of the other guys that went on to be stars that were training in OVW around the time you were training there? Um. Well, the Beast, obviously. Rest in peace, my my friend. Um, you know, he got up there eventually, uh, Mike Mondo was, you know, ended up be becoming part of the spirit squad, uh, guys that had just gotten up there around the time I was there that weren't in that training class, but were there, uh, Johnny Jeter, who was also part of the, tr uh, training squad, uh, Mark Magnus, who, uh, ended up becoming, what was his name? Muhammad Hassan, uh, shoot. Uh, and then of course, uh, Jillian, Jillian Hall, who, you know, ended up becoming a Divas champion and she had a nice run for a while uh shoot um and then uh, the heartthrobs uh uh you know um Tom's the promise and Romeo Roselli and then uh shoot uh for uh, Simon Dean who was Nova obviously uh you know from from ECW and then OVW um Chris Cage went up to be uh Kalen Croft um let's see Marty Marty Wright oh Marty Wright was in that training class too that's right Marty Wright who ended up becoming the boogeyman uh, gosh, uh, I know the list goes on. Seven was there, became Mordecai. Uh, um, I mean, you know, Doug Basham ended up going up there uh, not too terribly long after I got there. I mean, so there was, I mean, I mean, the list of talent, um, there were so many people that were in and around me during that time, Nick, uh, oh, Ken Doan, who was part of the Spirit Squad, Nick Nemeth, obviously, who's a huge name in the business. Uh, I mean, so many guys. Uh, it was so fortunate that we had such a, a great squad with us at the time. Uh, Cody Rhodes eventually joined us uh, when I was there. Um, I mean, and there, a ridiculous amount of talent was there at the time uh, that I was there. And uh, just to, to be around those guys and, and be able to call them brothers and, and friends and family, uh, you know, it's really, it was really awesome to to have that. I mean, I know I'm missing names just because there's so many people, uh, Aaron Stevens and, and, you know, other guys like that. I mean, I, it's incredible how many people got the, the chance to, to get the opportunity just by being part, become part of OVW and getting trained by the, uh, the amazing talented trainers and, and Jim Cornette, who's a, a genius in the encyclopedia of, of wrestling. So, yeah, we just were very fortunate, not to mention the fact that Danny Davis, who, you know, obviously owned uh, OVW, uh, was like, you know, a second dad to, to many of us and, and uh, just incredible with his knowledge as well. It's awesome. What percentage of the of the wrestlers training there were already wrestlers before getting signed? Because we hear all of those names doing pretty well on the main roster, but now... 
they don't always succeed, but there's a lot of lot more wrestlers these days that seem to be signed with zero experience. And I don't think they allow non-contract people to be in NXT uh, for the training like they used to. Uh, so, so was there was there less people uh, signed with no experience back then? I know Cody Rhodes, I think, may have been, but he's Dusty's son. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you have lineage, uh, you know, <laughs> that's kind of a, you know, a different story. Uh, but, you know, there weren't, I think most guys that were signed around when I was signed, they had some sort of training. Um, I think the only people that didn't really was like Linda Miles, uh, who was part of Tough Enough, and then um, uh, Johnny Nitro, uh, who was part of Eminem. Um, and then Matt Capitelli, God rest his soul, one of the most amazing people you could ever meet, nicest people. Um, but uh, for the most part, I'd say, you know, I think pretty much everyone there uh, would, had had some kind of wrestling experience. Oh, Nathan Jones did not have re- wrestling experience, <laughs> as far as I know. Or if he did, I you wouldn't know it. Uh, but yeah, but um, but yeah. Were and then, of course, of Nathan Jones? Uh, what's that? Were people afraid of Nathan Jones? Everybody but me. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, no, no. He says, no, he, um, no, I don't think so. He was such a nice guy, really. Like, you know, he was, you know, a seven foot monster. And yeah, he looked just as intimidating as, uh, you know, you would think he'd be just that, you know, tough and mean of a guy. And I'm, I, I, w- I wouldn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to tussle with him, you know, in real life, uh, you know. Cause I wouldn't want to hurt him, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, he's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. He's, he potatoed me a few times though. He potatoed me. Yeah. Cause I was just wondering with his uh, prisoner reputation, I forget what he was in jail for and being this monster. Right. If people would be like, oh, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, he, he does seem like a really nice guy when I met him too, but how were you uh, accepted as a non-contract guy? into OVW. I know there was a lot of them because I, I did it in deep South for a while and I was treated like absolute shit by the contract wrestlers. Did you say deep South? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you were down deep South. Yeah. Uh, but there was only like what I was the only one for a while. Then there was another guy. So we were really the outcasts, but Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was different in OVW. I know the atmosphere in general, I heard was much better there. Well, you had Bill DeMott, right? Yeah, Bill DeMott yeah. was there. Yeah, and there right. was there was really it was really clickish, and there was the people that Bill liked, and the people they didn't that's, like. And, and hey, that's you know, and that's the wrestling business in general. A lot of times, um, I know that when I was in OVW, they didn't have Deep South yet. They broke that apart. Like I'd probably say half, maybe like the first half of when I was there, and I remember you know Bill DeMott was going to be taking over that part, and he was up in OVW with us for a while uh before heading down to deep south um i never had an issue with him personally i know a lot of people did i know that uh a lot of people you know talked about you know hazing bullying whatever clicks all that stuff i personally didn't have an issue with him um i don't i don't think he really you know tried to you know do anything to me personally but i do know that you know i heard that you know deep south had its you know its clickish ways i guess uh i I was happy that I wasn't part of the deep South crew that got sent down there because they split us uh, into, into two groups. Uh, some people went down to deep South. Some people stayed up here. Um, but some of my friends that went down to deep South absolutely loved it too. So, I mean, you know, I guess it's, it was hit or miss depending on where you fell. Um, being a non-contract guy though, to answer your question, um, man, I never felt for a moment uh, that I wasn't accepted um, in OVW. Uh, by the contract guys or, or whoever the, the coaches um, it was a family uh, off the get go. Of course, you know, we still, you know, non-contract guys, especially um, still followed a lot of wrestling etiquette, you know, making sure you gave your seats to the veterans when it was time to uh, watch tapes or in the locker room for any reason, uh, you know, you always, you know, offered up your seat and you're always making sure to, you know, go up to them first and shake their hand and say hi. And, you, you know, the, the usual stuff that goes along with wrestling etiquette and making sure you don't catch any heat. Uh, but OVW really wasn't a place like that. Um, it was really 
crazy how much of a family uh, it was. I mean, it was the best locker room I've ever been in. Um, uh, Ring of Honor was the other locker room that I'd say uh, was really cool with, uh, you know, being a, a good knit of uh, people that, uh, you know, treat each other with respect. Um, you know, uh, I, the, actually, the only bad locker room I'd ever been in really was <laughs> WWE. Uh, and that's not me crying. That's just, you know, it is what it is. I mean, it was just the time I was there was kind of a, a, a little bit of a, a weird time to be there. And uh, a lot of people with insecurities and kind of just a, uh, you know, a different, a different, different atmosphere. Could you have seen with the way that the bullying was back then? And we've heard it from so many people and we'll talk about your personal situation after, but like a guy, if, if like Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn had come in at your time with the way that the bullying was, do you think it would have turned out the same way for them? Yeah. I mean, Hey, everybody's different. Um, I got to say that, you know, for, for, I don't think, I really don't feel like I would have caught any, any kind of heat. I tried to fly low under the radar. Unfortunately, it was just my tag partner. Didn't, we can get more into that in a little bit, but to answer your question, um, you know, someone like Kevin or Sammy, you know, they're their own people. I don't know how they would have interacted with people or stayed under the radar or anything like that, but it was tough when you were going up there and you're a new guy um, just to, just to try and do the right level of fly under the radar, but still make yourself noticed in a good way. Uh, so you're not going to get, you know, overlooked, but you're not going to get looked at where they're going to say, we got to go after this guy. So it's, it was a really fine line. It was, you're walking the type rope and it felt like it, you're like in a seven ring circus and you're on that type rope and feeling the pressure, uh, you know, constantly. And there wasn't really camera phones back then. The the photos were just coming out. But now, like, a lot more of that hazing and stuff would have come out to the public a lot quicker. And the WWE would have had to do something about it where it seemed like they looked the other way. But you you were mentioning uh, something in OVW with Bradshaw that was more of a friendlier hazing type thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> Look, I, I'm just saying that he didn't – he wasn't attacking me personally. He was just having fun. And, you know, him and Ron Simmons, we were doing a show somewhere out in like uh, – I don't know if it was Muncie, Indiana or somewhere somewhere out in Indiana within driving distance from uh, from OVW, Louisville. Um, and we were coming back, and it was uh, it was early spring. I'd say uh, – no, it was – no, it was some – I probably just started there. So it was probably, it wasn't early spring, but it was probably like mid spring, but it was a chilly night. And um, I remember we were heading back and uh, I just, I was in the back of the ring truck because there's no more room in the cars. So uh, Bradshaw and Ron Simmons were driving the ring truck. And I just remember sitting back there with another guy, um, <clears throat> the prophet uh, and uh Basically, all of a sudden, you just gallons of water just started flying back at us. You know, they're just dump flying, flinging water on us. And by the time we, you know, it was about, I'd say about an hour drive home and we're just drenched in water, the wind blowing at you at 70 miles an hour in a chilly, chilly uh, spring night. And I remember just shivering the whole way home, just like, <laughs> but I was like, I'm not putting it over. I'm not putting it over. I'm just going <laughs> to, I just laugh about it, laugh about it. And that was it. And, you know, <clears throat> It could have been worse, and but uh, you know, didn't complain one bit, and uh, and it was just part of the experience, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that that seems like uh, like fairly normal stuff that you would encounter in the business. Yeah, no big deal. So, as far as getting called up to the main roster, I understand in OVW you had different tag team partners, James Snelling. Huh? Yeah. I love you too, buddy. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's okay. Uh, at what point in time did they uh, team you with um, Chad? Uh, the wrong time, uh, if you want the uh, short answer. No. Um, basically, uh, I was wrestling with um, with Chris Cage. You know, we had a great thing going with it, with our tag team Adrenaline. And uh, we we're big, 
baby faces and loving it. And it was, it was, it was just awesome. It was, it was a great time. Had a lot of success with that. Um, and, um, it was sometime around when Chad got signed, uh, they brought him to OVW and, uh, by this time, you know, I already had my contract and they thought, you know, let's put these guys, these two together. They're both, you know, same height, same, you know, kind of stature, and uh, let's make them, you know, something. So that's what they did. And it was written, written into the storylines that he comes in. He's my cousin. And um, and he, he was going to kind of pull me away from from Chris. And it was going to be a whole tension thing. And I had to make a choice between the two. And and so, you know, that's kind of the angle that we played it. Uh, and it gave me – I will say that it was great in the way that it got me the opportunity to become a heel, which I wanted to do so badly because I pretty much my whole, actually my whole time I, I had been a, a baby face from the first day I started training. I guess it was because I, um, my look and uh, you know, I was a shorter guy in stature, so I could always be like the giant killer type of guy. Um, uh and when I got to finally become a heel, I thought that was great. It was great doing a heel turn, especially doing it on Cage because we had such a good chemistry and good time. And I thought this is going to be great because now Cage and I could start working some great matches. And uh, lo and behold, um, it wasn't long after I turned that I tore my bicep. And uh, and so then, you know, that angle kind of – we still ran with that angle, but uh, it was kind of me doing it from, you know – uh, a, a position of not being able to work for a few months, but, uh, or at least eight weeks. Yeah. So. I know when I was talking about this on uh, my news update earlier, Kenny Bolin posted a comment saying to ask you about him. Do you have any comments about him? What a piece of junk that guy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, Kenny, no, uh, Bolin. Pff, he's, he's the, uh, he's the moneymaker, man. It's Kenny Bolin. Um, no, he's, you know, he was always cool with me. Um, he always was super friendly with me. Uh, good guy. He, he really loved the business. Uh, he, <laughs> he was definitely a character. Uh, I loved hearing stories about uh, him and some of the, the things he would do, um, <laughs> which is, it's, it's pretty funny. Uh, but uh, yeah, he, he's definitely a good guy. Um, I know, he's polarizing. Some people love him. Some people can't stand him, but sometimes I think people get mixed up with uh, the character he played versus the person he was. Um, and, you know, backstage, he was always super nice to me, always cool. And, uh, you know, I, I wish him nothing but the best. And I understand you took the first ever RKO from Randy Orton in a match. Yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty cool. Um, it was before it was the RKO, of course, uh, you know, it was, it was actually, it was funny. It was my second match, uh, my second TV match. The first match, uh, that I had was a, I had just gotten to town. Um, I guess I got to town that Saturday, that Wednesday I had, they actually gave me a match. Uh, it was the, the, the first dark match before the TV show started and they put me in there and, uh, and I, I did a good job, I guess, uh, because the very next week they put me in there with uh, Doug Basham for the title, for the heavyweight title. Obviously, there's no chance in hell I'm winning the title, um, you know, being a fresh guy and Doug Basham getting the push uh, and he's doing an angle and all this other stuff and getting ready to head to the WWE. But it was just awesome that I had that opportunity to to and that they thought that I was you know, capable enough to to have a, a TV match with uh, with Doug. Uh, so that was my very first TV match, which was awesome. Um but then, uh, but then um, the second match was Randy Orton. So I mean, I had a strong start and really fortunate start in the business uh, in OVW, and I was just so so lucky to get that. But he he said to me, uh, he said, Tank, uh, you know, uh, I was just thinking, you know, Randy, uh, I mean, not Randy, uh, Diamond Dallas Page, he's not doing the uh, Diamond Cutter anymore because he's not in the WWE. And I was just thinking about, you know, starting to do it. He's like, Would you mind if I use that to, on you tonight? for the uh for the show and i said absolutely absolutely whatever you want you know you you know you 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 call the shots you tell me what you want to do and i'll do it so sure enough um you know we we worked out the match and figured out what we were going to do and 
and he hit me with it not once but twice and it was it was great and went off uh well the crowd the crowd was into it it was a good time i don't remember all of my matches i do remember that one um because it was just kind of a it was one of my first matches and i think my first few matches really stick in my head just because of uh the opportunity i was getting and that it was just like it was awesome to be wrestling against guys that were i knew were going to get up there and be something special so and of course tom pritchard i know you had some contact with him in development he was working in development a bit and also a trainer a bit he has a podcast on this channel it's actually airing at the same time right now well, uh, any comments about him yeah no dr tom man who, who doesn't I don't know if there's anyone on the planet who doesn't love Dr. Tom, unless you got, you know, you know, sour about him not getting, giving you a chance to get hired or he overlooked you for some reason. Or, I mean, I, I love the guy. I mean, he was nothing but super awesome to me. Um, he was the one that called me on the, and, and offered me the developmental contract. He was the one, one of the guys that was there at the training camp. Um, I, I will say this though, man, as nice as he was, and and I know he was super nice and not, not like towards me, not not a bad bone in his body or anything like that. I I know it had to be because of the position he was in, and um, the fact that I just wanted a contract so badly and I didn't want to screw it up. And every time I talked to him, and I don't know why this is, it's never happened with anyone in my entire life. Anytime I ever talked to him about, you know, working on getting the contract or asking questions or I would get so freaking nervous. I mean, I've never been so nervous in all my life. I actually would get so nervous. I'd actually start to tear up and I've never said that before to anyone. So it's an exclusive, but, uh, but no, I, I, for some reason I would get so nervous. I would, I would, and anxious, I would start talking to him, but I'd start tearing up a little bit. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with me? This, and it's never happened since. And, and, uh, but I think it was just that, I wanted that dream so bad and wanted the contract so bad and just wanted the opportunity that he was the guy that, you know, was basically the bouncer that was either going to let me in or, or kick me to the curb. So, yeah. Now I've wrestled your partner before, uh, Chad. And I, so I've been around him a little bit and I've had interactions at two various times, a few years ago, trying to do an interview with him. He was very flaky and like weird then he, then he seemed to have it more together now and was was preaching the bible to me and then flaked out again so i i could understand that meeting this guy if he was like that back then that you'd be like i don't know if i want this guy as my tag team partner because he just seems a bit out there not necessarily in a bad way but like yeah strange. Yeah, no, I mean, look, and and it's taken me many years to kind of, I guess, not feel so bitter or salty. And sometimes I'll still admit, I, at, some, at times I do, because I feel like things would have been different if uh, I had uh, a different situation um, as far as tag team partner or being solar or what have you. Um when he came to OVW and he had that um, grin ear to ear 24 seven, and it was just him trying to be positive all the time. Um, it was, it was, it was like kind of like unsettling. And I think, and it wasn't just me. It was, a, I, it was other people. And, you know, it, because when you're that smiley all the time, it's either, you're in you're you're just you're not being genuine or or you're or you maybe you're batshit crazy maybe a little bit of both or maybe you're just uh oblivious to things or i don't know what it was but i just never seen someone smile as much as he did so it was definitely just kind of for me maybe especially being from the northeast uh you know uh maybe it was a little offsetting and or off-putting and, and not sure how to take him um i know i know he he, he's not a, a, he's not a bad person and he's not he's he's i think he i think 90 percent of the time he means well uh I, I there was a couple things that that he did that rubbed me the wrong way uh like going behind my back and talking to stephanie about uh some character stuff that i didn't appreciate 
uh, without him talking to me about it first since we were a tag team. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't, he was just, yeah, flaky. And um, I kind of got that feeling from the start and, um, and kind of hard to get through into his head sometimes, try to talk to him. Uh, so it frustrated me. And a lot of people knew I was frustrated it sh- so much so that it, it got pretty much written into the, the DNA of, uh, of the tag team of the Tolans. Uh, that when, when we were the blonde bombers, the Tolans, uh, you know, he ended up being my annoying cousin, Chad, that, and you could just see me always yelling at him and, and barking at him, which was probably pretty much what I do to him a lot of times backstage too. Not to be a jerk, but it's like, sometimes you try to talk to him at first and then you just, it's just like in either in one ear, out the other, or it's just bouncing off his head uh, and not going in to begin with. So, yeah, I mean, hey, look, it is what it is. He's, He's not a bad guy, though. I don't. I don't really hold anything bad against him at all. Uh, I wish him the best. Uh, we went through some crazy times together, uh, you know, once we were up there. But you know, mainly because of him. But hey. Yeah. yeah. Like the other weird thing about it is, before I was expected to interview him, I watched a few other podcasts he's done, and it seems like he can't even remember some fairly big events, like the one where he locked. The Undertaker and all these stars in the bathroom, they're asking him about it because I guess you told the story properly, but he couldn't even remember. And it's like, how do you not even remember this? Well, you know, he he had a decent amount to drink um, those two nights, but I don't think so much that he was blackout drunk or anything and couldn't remember. I think also, you know, it was an embarrassing moment for him and a tough moment for him to go through at that time to begin with, let alone, um, you know, talk about it on podcasts and interviews, even if it had been years later. Uh, but, you know, so, yeah, I, 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 I know he kind of falls short on some of the details that I know for a fact happened because I was a hundred percent sober and, and B, uh, lived it myself and, and, uh, could tell you every little detail, um, because it was part of what ended up part of my demise in the WWE. So, yeah, I don't, I think he just does. I think a lot of it's embarrassment and, you know, Hey, look, I don't think he, he should be embarrassed of what happened. It wasn't really, you know, is it his fault that it kind of got brought on him? Yeah. Um, hit the, the, but you know, it is what it is. I mean, if it wasn't for that, it might've been for something else he did. I think they're, you know, especially when you're on tour, they're always looking for someone to, to, to mess with it with mess with you. And, uh, and if you become the target, uh, it's not hard for them to, to keep stirring it until something happens. So, yeah. So as far as the, the backstage stuff that I think the worst part of it was the, the bathroom incident, which I'll ask you about, and then there was some sort of physical altercation. But how did it start? Was it gradual? Was there certain people that were that were hazing more than others? Because I think it was Benoit, Bradshaw, and maybe The Undertaker. There seemed to be three of the main ones that, that night at uh, the international tour. Yeah, so what, the way it started was um, basically we were getting ready to go on tour. The the dicks had just started and um, the dicks had just started uh, their, their whole thing. And, um, and so now I'm James Dick, he's Chad Dick. And we're, I'm just saying to myself, Holy shit, how do we become the dicks? We are supposed to be freaking weapons of mass seduction or something else, or we are supposed to be Simon Dean's henchmen, you know, but all of a sudden we became the dicks, which is, you know, it is what it is and crazy. But um, so being the dicks and we were wrestling stripper Chippendale, whatever you call it. Uh, you know, Chad thought, Hey, you know, uh, we should really learn how to dance better. And I don't know if it was just in his mind, you know, I know you'd heard the story already, but you know, he, he said, no, Hey tank, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go dance with this, this guy over at his house and learn some dance moves. He's, he's a stripper and, uh, we're going to learn some moves. He's like, you're coming. Right. And I'm like, no, I'm not coming. And uh, he's like, why not? I'm like, Chad, I'm not going to some dude's house and dancing all night. 
uh, if I want to learn how to dance, I'll watch YouTube or, you know, whatever I, I need to do to, to, <laughs> to learn, um, you know, but I'm not just going over some random guy's house and, and dancing. And, and so he went and danced until, I don't know, four, what, whatever, well, four, whatever o'clock in the morning, the day before we're leaving. Uh, and he shows up to the airport and uh, he's like, tank, tank, you got to check this out. And he's holding the camcorder and, you know, he shows me and it's him and this dude just dancing. And I'm like, I'm thinking off right off the bat. I'm like, holy shit. Chad, do not show anyone that tape. <laughs> you will get destroyed. And by you getting destroyed, I will get destroyed because, you know, tag to partners, you know, it's it's live and die together. It's, it's That's how it works sometimes. So as I said, please, whatever you do, just don't let anyone see that tape. Once again, off his head, does not listen to a thing I said. We are in the locker room now in, uh, I guess it was Mexico. And sure enough, um, he's already, you know, doesn't have fans because, uh, you know, he didn't like, he was complaining about other hazing that had been already been going on. And um, and next thing you know, I see someone holding the, the camcorder and laughing. And then that hit, that it was a probably like Joey Mercury or something. And then it gets handed over to, to so-and-so and then to Benoit and from Benoit goes to freaking JBL. Then JBL goes to, to Undertaker. And then, and I just remember Undertaker looking at that camera. I remember this plain as day. Undertaker looking at that camera, looking at that video, taking a big sigh and then just shaking his head. And he just handed it back. And then that night, sure enough, got the call, going to wrestler's court, going to wrestler's court. And that was the beginning of the whole big, uh, you know, craziness, uh, shenanigans that went down. Nowadays, you would think that if they want to have you do the stripper tag team, that they would have actually had you do stripper dancing lessons and, and paid for by the company. So you guys wouldn't have to resort to that. It does seem weird for sure. Uh, so for, for the people that don't know, could you tell the other part? Because I know a lot of the fans here uh, probably haven't heard about it because I only heard about it recently. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you the abridged version because um, uh, I could talk to you three hours just about that. Um, but no, it, it was basically that whole thing went down with uh, him showing the tape and he already had some heat with JBL. Um, and, you know, JBL doesn't, you don't even have to have heat for him to stir the pot uh, with people, um, you know. And uh, so basically, um, I remember, you know, a couple other things that happened before that um, where we were getting hazed and, and you know, eventually Benoit came up to me and said, hey, Tank, um, you know, you, you take in the hazing well. We're not we're not he didn't say hazing, but he said you took the ball busting going well and we're not going to keep messing with you. Uh, you know, you're good. You're one of the boys, uh, but you got to talk to your, your partner, man. He's like he's not he's not doing well. Uh, he's got to chill out, you know, not not be a baby about stuff. And uh, so that was part of it. And then so by the time this camcorder thing came out and they see him dancing, uh, you know, we get called down to wrestler's court and uh, we're in like Chihuahua, Mexico or something. I don't know. And um, and I get called down and there's just this big round table in the private catering room. It's at night and uh, everyone's sitting around this table. It's like, you know, Bradshaw and Undertaker and Orlando Jordan and Animal and uh, and uh, Benoit and, uh, you know, you know, a few of the other, a few of the other guys and, uh, <clears throat> and there's Chad. And then there's one seat open and next to Undertaker. And I just walking in there, I was like, oh, I'm saying to myself, oh shit. But uh, I, I played it cool. And I just walked up and I saw the chair was open. I said, I said, uh, Undertaker, I said, you mind if I sit here? He goes, go ahead, have a seat. I said, okay. I said, mind if I have a beer? He's like, sure, go ahead. And uh, because I know if I, didn't ask for a beer. They were start feeding them to me left and right. So I asked for one right off the bat and I, I actually pretended like I was drinking it more than I was uh, nursing it because I didn't want to be messed up for the next day. Um, and, uh, you know, the first thing they said is, so Tank, welcome to Wrestler's Court. 
And uh, that was, you know, JBL. And uh, basically I was asked, so Tank, tell me, if your partner wants to dance with a guy till the early hours of the morning to become better at his, you know, gimmick, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you go and dance with him? Uh, and I just thought to myself, holy shit, Chad, did you just throw me under the bus? Uh, and I thought, well, I'm just going to be honest here. And so I said, you know what? I'll tell you. It's just, it, I said, not, nothing, I said nothing against it, but I said it just felt gay to me. And I just, it, I just, it felt gay. And they looked at me, shook their heads. And then they were like, you're goddamn right, Chad. Admit you're a faggot. You know, they dropped the F-bomb on them and uh, you admit you're gay, you're a faggot. You're, you know, and uh, I was like, holy shit. I was like, oh my God. I was like, here it comes. And uh, I mean, I felt relieved that they weren't coming after me now, but at the same time, I was like, shit, they're going after him. And uh, and he's like, I'm not gay, I'm not gay. I swear, I swear, I'm not gay. And and then he started crying. And once he started crying, uh, they're like, you know, throwing the napkins up in the air. There's no crying and wrestling. What are you, what the hell? What's wrong with you, your mama's boy, faggot? You know, that kind of stuff. And um, and uh, and he's like, I swear I'm not gay, I'm not gay. And 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 he's crying. And you're like, all right, calm down, calm down, stop crying, stop crying, do some jumping jacks, do some push-ups. So he's crying, doing jumping jacks and push-ups and all that stuff. And then and uh, and and Orlando Jordan is like, Chad, if anyone knows gay, I know gay, and you're gay. And uh, so basically, you know, he's he's upset about that whole thing and, and he's just trying to defend himself now. And so, you know, they're having their fun with it. And they're saying so, and they knew that that we already had some some issues as far as uh, you know, not good chemistry. And so, like Chad, so Tanks Tanks says he's the captain of the of the team. And uh, so, what's the deal here? If why are you letting him call the shots? Why why don't you be a man and call some of the shots? Why don't you tell him that you're going to call the shots? And so they're goading him in to try and say you know, trying to get him to to stand up to me, and uh, which it wasn't. I didn't ever try to make it like that to begin with, but basically bottom line is uh, they get him to, to say to me, tank, I'm a man. And from now on, I'm going to call the shots too. And I get to have equal say and blah, blah, blah. And he's just going, oh my God, oh my God. And, and so they say, basically they're like tank. So you guys have had some, some issues out there uh, and just got to know why haven't you guys fought? And I said, uh, I said, we just haven't fought. I mean, they had heard that, you know, I had pulled over the car on the side of the road and wanted to beat his ass because he had talked behind my back to Stephanie about about gimmicks that, you know, he should have cleared with me first about, you know, about, you know, th things. But uh, so I think they got caught wind that how frustrated I was with the situation. And um, and so they tried to go him into a fight and they said to me, uh, they said, why, why haven't you ever fought him? I said, I just haven't. And they said, why not? I said, I don't know. Just have, I just, I just haven't. I try, I'm trying to work through this, you know? And they said, Chad, why haven't you fought him? And he's like, I just haven't. And he's trying to, you know, say, and then he goes, tell me why. He goes, I'll tell you why. Because my mama taught me to walk away from a fight. And then they just lose their shit. They're like, your mom, your mom, you can't bring your mom into this. You can't bring your mom into wrestling. And uh, you're, you're a mama's boy, little faggot, queer motherfucker. And drop the, I mean, going off on him. It was pretty terrible. Uh, and I, I felt bad for him, but I was like, at this point, I was like, man, you brought this on yourself. I told you not to bring that damn freaking camcorder. And so they said, Chad, you need to stand up to him right now and hit him. You need to hit him. And so, you know, eventually after minutes and minutes of just beating him down, he's like, stands over top of me. I'm sitting in my seat and I'm, he's like, ah, oh, tank, tank. And he's got his back to the boys. Right. And he's like, ah, oh, tank. He's like, he's gonna like wind up and hit me. And, and he like literally looks at me and he winks and he goes, and he's like, he's like, go with it, like type of thing, right? And they see him wink and they said, whoa, whoa, did you just wink? Did you, are you trying to plan a fake fight? You can't, you can't plan a fake fight with, against the boy, the boy, this is what we do. He's like, you can't plan a fake fight. And I was like, oh my God, this, he's just burying himself further and further and further. So Luckily, you know, at that point, it was getting real late. I, I was like, hey, guys, would you mind if I go to the bathroom real quick? They're like, no, no problem. Go ahead. I go to the bathroom. As I'm going to the bathroom, I'm just finishing up, and he's 
busts in the door and he's like, Tank, Tank, please, you got to help me. Please, you got to help me. Please, please, please. I was like, Chad, what do you want me to do? You, you really, you know, you've done it good this time. And he's like, he's like, just let me hit you one time, please. And I was like, are you out of your damn mind? I said, if I let you hit me, then I become the pussy ass bitch. And I said, I can't, I can't do that. I was like, you got to find a way to dig yourself out, man. And he's like, please. And I was like, no, I was like, I can't. And I was like, look, dude, figure it out, man. And I walk out, I walk out. And as I'm walking out, all those guys are walking in, you know, Undertaker and, and, and Animal and uh, JBL and, uh, and Benoit. And, you know, they're all walking in there. Oh, I, I, was Booker T there? He's there the next one. But anyway, bottom line, they all walk in, they're going to the bathroom and I'm waiting there. Now I'm waiting near right outside the bathroom. There's an elevator and I'm just waiting there, hoping, hoping that they'll say, all right, let's wrap this up and, and call it a night. So I'm waiting there and, you know, Chad's once again, begging me. And this, to this point now, I, and I, I, I shit you not. He's on his hands and knees looking up at me and saying, please let me hit you one time. Please let me hit you one time. And I felt so bad for the guy. But at the same time, I was like, this, this guy, I, there's no getting through to him. I was like, I, I, I'm like, you're in for it. So he, he basically um, is begging me. And I'm wondering, like, where are these guys at? Like, why aren't they out of the bathroom yet? And then meanwhile, as you know, as, as, you, as you heard the story, but for those who haven't, they're in the bathroom and Undertaker goes to open the door. And as he goes to open the door, looks back at the guys and said, little bastard locked us in, which from what I understand was they they started dying laughing. He went from being so buried to like just being over as a motherfucker. Right. I mean, he was over. They loved him. They thought that it was, it was great. He, they, he turned the tables. That's all it took for him to do was to, to, to turn the tables was him for him to do that because they thought it was awesome. But the one person that hadn't gotten locked out was Orlando Jordan, and he was going to the bathroom. He saw it was locked. He unlocked it, and they came out. And when he came, they came out, they saw Chad up down on his knees begging me. And so he went from being down, buried, to being over, to going even further down than ever before. And uh, that was that. And then uh, they're like, all right, this is, this is pathetic. And so let's call it a night. So we all get on the elevator, and Chad's now just like, I mean – like inconsolably crying on the elevator as we're going up and they're just like nudging him in into him and bumping him and 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 I was just like God this is terrible and um I did feel bad for the guy how bad he's being you know bullied at that moment uh and then like they're all getting off all getting off and then finally like Chad Chad's getting off at his room and I, I go off because I was like I said I felt so bad for this guy's like they're I'm scared he what he might do to himself uh, it just seemed like he was in such a bad place so I was like, all right, I'm going to go and calm him down and stuff. So went back to his, uh, to his room and, and said, Hey dude, like I tried to have a long talk with him, tried to calm him down and say, you can't let him get to you like that. So that's what happened that night only to be followed up by a worse night, which led to the fight. So, um, which is a much quicker story. <laughs> yeah. Just one question that kind of shows that Benoit did have a bit of a darker side to him. Because he was, I guess, involved in that. Did you did you notice that that Benoit had another side to him before that news came out about the murder? Um, you know, Benoit was Benoit had when I got up there, like I'd I'd known Benoit for a little while before uh, things had happened with Eddie, and he was always super nice to me. Um, very intense person, extremely intense. When you would speak to him, it was just like, I mean, like he'd be looking through you. It was so intense, but I mean, at times, but, but also smiling, laughing sometimes, but it was funny because, um, he was always nice to me, but after, after, um, Eddie died and, you know, that being like his best friend brother, like he just was in a bad place. Um, and that was when I was up there and, uh, you know, he, 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 Eddie had just passed in when we were up in Minneapolis. And I just remember we had to go on a tour to Japan um, shortly after that. And I was working out with uh, Benoit at the Gold's Gym in Tokyo. And I just remember we were working out and um, he, we got on the elevator and 
he just broke down on the elevator and started crying on my shoulder at, you know, how sad he was and devastated by the loss. And I think, I think he was probably drinking and, and, uh, maybe doing some, some pills, uh, you know, I can't say for sure, you know, what he was doing, but, you know, I think he was under the influence of other things just to kind of kill the pain. Like a lot of people do when they're so devastated by certain things. And, um, I think that had an effect on his, um, emotional stability and his character because i mean he was always someone i looked up to um as a wrestler and um and to see him go through some stuff like that was tough but yeah i mean he there was a there was when he was drinking and partying uh there's definitely another side that, that uh that that would come out um uh you know i mean there was a there's a nickname for him um pub pilled up benoit um, which was, you know, kind of something that was floating around by uh, a couple of the boys. Um, not me personally, but it was just something I heard. But uh, yeah, definitely a different side to to Benoit uh, from from you know what you're what you're probably used to thinking. Yeah, I think I heard Justin Roberts uh, say he had witnessed that side as well in another interview. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, he also had. A, he was another guy that had his uh, passport stolen and was as and was bullied around those times. But I'll let you get into the other uh, story that led to the actual fight between you yeah. and Chad, which unfortunately got you released, even though all the top stars were instigating it. Uh, that was, those those were the times. It, yeah, it would have been a different story nowadays for sure. It would have. Uh, I would say it probably would have never gotten to that, especially with social media being the way it is. And with, uh, you know, with the whole bullying movement going on the way it is, um, it's just a different vibe now and shit doesn't fly the way it used to. Uh, I wish it had been like that when I was there. Um, you know, at the same time, it is what it is. I still got an opportunity to be up there. I was still happy to have the shot, my dream, uh, people that came before me and years before me and years before that, you know, they had it even worse than, than what we had it because, you know, back then they'd, they'd stretch it. They'd really put it, put it, you know, put the gears into you, but you know, it is what it is. So to get to, to it real quick with the fight, you know, the stuff had happened the night before with Chad and, and uh, you know, we went to, we were wrestling in Mexico city and that night it was on the card. It was showing all the matches and then it said, um, it was basically our match, and it was um, instead of saying the dicks, it said a dick and a pussy versus uh, I think it was the Mexicals. So or either that or uh, you know uh, London and Spanky or something, but probably Mexicals. Um, but anyway, regardless. Uh, so I remember we were wrestling in the ring, and every time I'd go in, I'd be wrestling, I'd do my thing, I'd tag out. Chad would go in, and over the over the loudspeaker you would hear a baby crying at, every time he got in the ring. You just hear, wah, wah, and oh, my gosh. It was like, and I know the boys in the back were probably losing it. Obviously, it was something that The Undertaker or one of the top guys had, you know, told the sound guy to, to put through the speakers. Uh, so that was, it was something. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe that's happening during a live show. It's crazy. Um, and I remember seeing Steamboat, who was our agent for that match, uh, sitting over there on the sidelines just, losing it just cracking up uh but uh but yeah so that happened and then so that night i was like okay well hopefully that's just the last of it and we can be done with this this uh this this uh horrible trip to mexico um and uh sure enough i was in bed for 20 minutes and i get a call on the phone from benoit and and they're and he's like hey tank i'm coming up to get you your boy's at it again I'm like, Jesus Christ. So Benoit comes to my room, gets me. We go down to the this big, this big uh, uh, banquet room where we had all of our pr private catering. And and now instead of it just being a few of the guys, it was the TV crew, the whole everybody, all the all pretty much. I think all the workers, like you know, all the every of the crew, everybody, everybody was there. And on all these tables, you saw it was weird. You saw piles of money in the middle of these tables. And I was like, what the hell? And once again, there's one seat open at the main table for yours truly next to undertaker. And uh, once again, I was like, mind if I sit here? Oh, go ahead. So I sit down. Mind if I have a beer? Oh, go ahead. Now they started off hot 
and they're like, Chad, you guys got to settle this right now. Chad's already, you know, got a few in him. And uh, I think he's now saying, okay, I got to do something. I got to prove myself. And, uh, you know, and I'm like, what the hell? So he starts chirping at me and, uh, and I'm like, Chad, chill out. I was like, I was like, you don't have to do this. You can just calm down, relax, you know, don't let them get to you. Cause at this point I'm just saying like, look, don't let them get to you. You're, you know, I'm just, I, before I would just shut up and I'm like, don't let these boys get to you. I was like, just don't put it over. I was like, that's your problem. You're, you're putting it over. He's like, no tank. I got to stand up for myself and blah, blah, blah. He's like, you're not going to tell me what to do anymore. And now, so I'm sitting there and I have a beer in my hand and I just, I'm taking a sip of it and I'm like, Chad, relax, relax. And I'm like rocking back on my, on two, on my two legs of the chair. You know how you rock back in the chair. I'm taking a drink. And as I take a drink, wham, he hits me and I go flying off the back of the chair. I basically do a, a roll, a back roll. And next thing you know, he's got me in a front face lock. And as he has a, me in a front face, lock, I'm like, I'm like, damn it, Chad. I said, damn it, Chad. Now I got to freaking hit you. And so as I, I'm, I'm getting up, I get up and I get out of the, the, uh, the front face lock and I push him. I'm like, I'm like, you idiot. And I just gave my, I gave him a quick, like, bam, I just a quick smack across the face. I was like, knock it the fuck off. I'm not going to lose my job because of you. I'm not going to do this, you know, cause I didn't want to get in trouble. And, uh, as stupid as it sounds, I mean, like I didn't want to get heat from the office. It's more important than, you know, getting heat from the boys. I mean, uh, obviously, um, but, uh, but yeah, so basically when I did that, they all thought it was hysterical. They're like, Chad, they're like, Chad, you cheap shot and motherfucker. They're like you got, you got, you hit tag. And then he got up and smacked you right back in the face. Like a bitch you are. And, uh, and everybody thought it was hysterical. And, 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 uh, JBL's laughing his ass off on the other side of taker. And he's like, oh, oh tank, oh, 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 tank, oh man, oh, I gotta cheers you on that one, man. Oh, come on. And I'm like, I was like, I was like, Chad, Chad, uh, Chad, knocked the beer out of my hand. I don't want it. He's like, Undertaker's like, here, have mine. I'm like, all right. So I'm going to 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 cheers JBL because if I don't, you know, I'm gonna catch heat. Um, and so as I go to, ch- as I'm going to give him the cheers. I see out of the corner of my eye, I see Chad getting ready to wind back and hit me again. And I, he's like this. And I, and I look at him, I'm like, and he goes, he goes like this. He goes, he has the audacity to go, psych. <laughs> and everybody lost their, like, psych. They're like, psych, you're about to cheap shot him again. And he's, he's like, ah, I'm nah, just playing. And I'm like, oh my God. So I just shake my ha- head and I'm just like, all right, whatever. I go to, to, um, to uh, cheers JBL because I had to still do that. And as I go to do that, boom, he catches me. He catches me. He hit me again. And as he hit me again, I stumbled back a couple paces. And I'm like, son of a bitch. I said, now I got to whoop your ass. And so he starts begging off, like doing his big best Ric Flair imitation. Time out like that kind of shit. And he's like, no, 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 we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. And I was like, no, we're not. And so unfortunately I had to hit him. So I bopped him three times. I hit him. First shot was first shot was right in the lip, put his teeth through his lip. Second shot, I broke his nose. Third shot, I hit him right in the uh, in in the eye, and uh, and and he went down cold. And uh, that was it. And that, and by that point, I just think I lost it, and I just jumped on top of him. I was gonna gonna put a pounding on him, and because uh, I was just so mad at that point, and uh, and they pulled me off him real quick, and he was just bloodied up and, and a white a white button down shirt, of course, of all things. So just look like a bloody mess. Um, and, uh, and he's like, you know, they pick him up. He's half freaking conscious. And they're like, and, uh, they're the, the guys are like, get him the fuck out of here. They're like, drag, get him, get him out of here. So Jamie Noble and I think Matt Hardy dragged them off to his room and, uh, they came over to me and, uh, all of a sudden they just, they, they came up to me and they handed me these piles of money, which apparently I guess the bets, they, these were bets on the table. How long would the fat fight last? Who would win? Blah, 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 blah. And they gave me this big wad of money and they said, here, Tank, you deserve this. You're one of the boys. We love you, but we can't stand your partner. And, uh, and I was like, shit. And I looked down at my hand and my hand had a, uh, a huge gash in it and I could see the bone and I had 
torn a ligament and uh, broke my finger. I got a boxer fracture. And, uh, and luckily, seeing that everyone's there, uh, the doctor at the time was there. And he goes, I had a feeling something was going to happen. And he goes, all right. He goes, let me take a look at it. He's like, yeah, you tore, you tore a tendon. He goes, who here wants to see me do a tendon repair? And of course, all the boys are like, yeah, I do, I do. And so uh, the funny part uh, is it uh, was I was I was actually scared to get the needle into my, <laughs> into my hand for the Novocaine for them to do the repair right there. Uh, so which was, of course, more Mexico City. It's a banquet room. I just punched someone in the face and their teeth. I put his teeth through his bottom lip, which what cut my finger open. So, of course, this is sanitary. So he he repairs the tendon right there in front of all the boys watching. And I'm just thinking, don't be a pussy and, and cry when he gives me the, the needle. <laughs> and I, I didn't feel a thing. I was too jacked up with adrenaline, but um, oversharing. But anyway, uh, stitches me back up. And and, uh, and that was it. That was the night. And I was just like, get me the fuck home. So later on, I almost lost that finger from an infection uh, two weeks later. But that's another story. When, when I was in Japan, yeah. So. Was that before or after you were released? What's that, the uh, finger? Yeah, the infection. Uh, oh yeah, that that was I was I still under contract. I still oh, under yeah. contract. Yeah, so they had to pay for it. But uh, but yeah, so uh, yeah, that that sucked, man. That I just had a you know you know I had a bad feeling oh, from the time I was one of the dicks it was they decided I was going to be a the, one of the dicks. I knew it was going to be a an issue. So hey, it is what it is, though, man. You know what are you going to do? So how did they go about releasing you? Were you with? Uh, were you still continuing the tour and wrestling a bit before they called you in over the fight, or what was the reason given? I did. Uh, I think I did one more tour. It was like I, I think because I was already scheduled, and I guess I was. I did another. I think I did another show. Yeah, because I remember uh, our last match on TV was against the Boogeyman, which is you know we and we lost. Uh, to the boogeyman uh he was getting a little his, his push and um and uh and so you know we were we were his uh cannon fodder for that and then uh wasn't i think it was right after that week of tv we got the the call it was sometime in i think february and uh and just got the call it was we were on a three-way call um it was i was in my car and chad was wherever the hell he was probably at the dancer's house um I'm just kidding. Uh, and um, Johnny Ace was on the other line, and he's like, "Oh gosh, you know, it's uh, uh, I hate to hate to have to do this, be the bearer of bad news, but you know, uh, you guys just can't be fighting up there. You know, it's uh, you know we're a publicly traded company. It doesn't look good, and uh, you know, blah blah blah. You know, a bunch of bullshit you know, that Johnny Ace will throw at people, and the old you know wish you best with your future endeavors, fucking speech bullshit. You know." Johnny never liked me anyway, which is fine, whatever. I don't really care. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, you know, I, when I got that though, I remember just feeling so, I wasn't even angry at that point. I was just so numb. Uh, and then I went into a depression and felt angry and pissed off and, you know, mad at the world for a while. Uh, but, uh, you know, Hey, what are you going to do? But it was, it, you know, after that, actually it was nice. Uh, I had the opportunity to, you know, uh, Danny, Danny Davis asked me if I'd be one of the, the uh, trainers at OVW. So I was, you know, obviously very, um, uh, you know, honored with uh, him asking me to be a trainer. And so it was awesome. That I got to, to be one of the trainers there and, and, and to help uh, some of the upcoming talent and, uh, and find new talent. So it was, it was really, it was really cool. So, I mean, I try to find the silver lining and that's the silver lining is what I said. I got to, to become a trainer at OVW and, uh, and, uh, help, help other people, you know, find some greatness. You mentioned animal was, uh, was around. Uh, I actually saw you guys at a house show in, in Buffalo face the new road warriors of animal and hide and right. I know you wrestled them a lot. I think you actually beat them once. Yeah. In London. Games. No, it was Manchester, England. Yeah. 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 Yeah, how was, was how was working with them? Because Animal didn't like Hyde and Wright either, similar to your situation. Yeah, I mean, they, I, they, I, I mean, I don't know how what their exact um, their whole their whole uh, chemistry was. I mean, obviously, 
you know, it was Animal and Hawk. I mean, it's sometimes it's like, it was like when I wrestled with Cage, that was my boy. And that was the guy who I felt like I had an awesome chemistry with and we had a good thing going. And then when you don't have that anymore and you have to adapt to a new person who you don't, you know, see eye to eye with or you, for one reason or another, you don't get along with, it's it's tough. So um, Animal was a super cool guy with me, obviously a legend in the business, um, you know, one of the best tag teams of all time. And I, so I was just honored to be able to to be in the ring with him uh, even if it was just ha one half of the, the the original team, but I will say, um, uh, who's the stiffest guy I ever worked? Oh, oh uh, okay, I'll get. I, I can answer that. Um, but uh, sorry, people pop up at the bottom. My ADHD just goes there sometimes. But anyway, to answer your question, I uh, you know, Animal was cool. Heidenreich, um, super super nice uh, guy, and and I know they might not have had the best uh, chemistry together. They, they tried probably, you know, just as hard as I did with uh, Chad and, you know, it is what it is, but uh, working them was cool. I will say at that house show in particular, uh, like I said, I don't remember all my matches, but I do remember that one uh, up in Buffalo um, or was it Buffalo or Syracuse? I think it was, we say Buffalo, right? It was Buffalo the night that I, that I saw it. Yeah, we are in Buffalo and Syracuse. Um, but uh, I will say that that um, I remember both those nights because I took the finishing move from them both nights. And Heidenreich, uh, you know, I'm up on top of animal shoulders. And as I'm up there, I see Heidenreich up on the top rope. And I'm thinking to myself, OK, man, I, I just nice and easy, buddy. Nice and easy. And he comes down. And I mean, all of a sudden, wrestling was real. Bam! I mean, he hit me so hard off the top of his shoulders. And I, I mean, he hit me and my head went to the side. I got a stinger down my arm. And I still remember that fire that I felt like, I mean, I'd played football my whole life. I never got a stinger like that. And um, I just remember laying on the ground. I'm supposed to be out, but like my arms on fire. So I'm doing my best to just lay there still so they can put the one, two, three on me. Meanwhile, I, I just felt like I was dying. Um, and so I get to the back of the room. I was like, hey, uh, Good, good match. <laughs> like I said, good match. And I knew that we were going to be doing it again uh, the next night. And I was like, hey, I was like, John, man, uh, just so you know, I will take the best backflip off of animals' freaking back. You, It'll look awesome. If you just, just nice and easy, lay it in there nice and easy. So that way I can make sure I can really rotate well and make it look awesome for you. Um, and he's like, oh, yeah, no problem, brother. No problem. And he meant it, too. It wasn't like he was working me. He really did mean it. He's super nice. And I love John. Um, but next night, sure enough, same thing. Top of the shoulders, boom, hits me. I got an other singer, second stinger. Um, and <laughs> man, I couldn't, my, my, I, I couldn't bench right for like three months after that. But, uh, but yeah, so, uh, it was, it was, uh, interesting working with those, those guys. I, I actually wrestled hide and right a couple times. And one of the times that he gave me the clothesline, it wasn't your. It wasn't the doomsday device. But it was just a regular running clothesline. I actually saw stars. Oh yeah. Like, oh yeah. 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 The That's... dots were all over mm -hmm. my eyes. Yep. I saw the. I've seen the dots a few times. You know, more than my fair share. But that was that was two of the nights. And then I remember uh, getting kicked by by London one time. Pretty good. That that had me. Well, London and Spanky at the same time. They gave me like a double kick at the same time, and that had me seeing stars. Uh, which was which was fine too because it looked good um, in the end. Uh, and then the other one I definitely remember seeing stars is when the uh, Undertaker choke slammed me uh, when he made his comeback when he's getting ready to go against uh, Randy Orton, and he had been gone for a while and he came out and we were all in the ring and and uh, he took a few people out and I was one of the people that you know I was the first guy he, after uh, getting the after he gave Simon Dean the big boot he came and uh, choke slammed me so it was pretty cool I was. You know, it's an honor to say I got choke slammed by the Undertaker. I remember him saying, "I need to choke slam someone," and I said, "And he said, uh, who can get up?" And I said, "I can get up. I'll get up for you. I got ups." And because uh, I was a short guy, but I could I could slam dunk a, a basketball at that time, so I was like, "I'm gonna get I'm gonna get myself up for this guy." I was like, "I'll take it." And so he said, "Okay." And so sure enough, he picked me up. I was up there, and man, I swear, if I wasn't a basketball getting dunked right there, man, he I I think at that moment I'd never been hit so hard. But uh, but hey, it's cool. And my friends still bust my chops to this day when they 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 send me the the clip online. 
And last thing I'll, I'll squeeze in here to ask you about, you mentioned yeah. you were in OVW at the same time as Boogeyman. Were you there for the infamous Jim Cornette Santino thing? Which one? Which one? The Jim Cornette what? The the slapping of Santino with... Oh, uh, oh God. I was, I mean, I was like a couple feet away. I mean, I was, I mean, I was, I was probably the closest person to them, actually, funny enough. Um, it was, it was, uh, I was there, I thought you were going to say when Al Snow asked him how old he was. Uh, yeah, he, he was really uh, like, my, he, he aged really well, didn't he? Oh my God. He's, <laughs> the dude is timeless. I mean, first off, he's an awesome guy. He's actually one of my traveling partners when I was on the road and, uh, we'd always have to find a bait shop so we could pick up live worms. And, um, and, uh, it was, it, but I mean, such a nice guy. Um, you know, it was, it, he's a prime example of someone that is very athletic. Um, didn't, um, a hundred percent find the fluidity of, of working as a technical wrestler, but he just had such an amazing character, such, uh, charisma and just, he loved the business. He, he loved everybody. I mean, He's still to this day. He's I I I I hit him up on Facebook. We, you know, message me uh, and and each other, and, and I'm like, I love you, buddy. He's like, I love you. He loves everybody. He's just an awesome dude. But um, but yeah, he he's someone as timeless as far as his age, and he um, he was one of those guys that he wasn't the best technical guy, but he made he used everything he had to become successful. And for that, I say kudos to him because, you know. Not everybody's able to do that. And Santino is someone that came, you know, he was he was doing a they tried to make him, you know, at first before he, you know, this is after he got slapped. They tried to make him like uh, some real like technical tough wrestler because he has like a black belt in judo and all this stuff. And he's a he's pretty badass in real life. But um, but I, but, you know, he didn't become a character until later on, just fucking around at uh, in practice. And they, you know ended up saying, Hey, this is, this is a great character. Let's go with this. And, uh, so that's how that worked. But the coronet, um, yeah, I remember boogeyman was like, basically, uh, it was one of his debuts and he had to chase someone through the audience that took off. It was either like Aaron Stevens or someone. And, and he had to go through, uh, part of the audience. And that part of the audience was the, um, was the uh was the training class the amateur training class and they're supposed to be there as part of the audience watching and they're supposed to be like horrified and jump back um as not to do it to the real fans and i guess um santino didn't put it over enough um and from what i understand it's because his daughter was right there and and he didn't want his daughter to get super scared or something to that effect so i guess he didn't he didn't intentionally do it to to you know, screw over boogeyman or to make the, the stuff not look good. But Cornette was really hot about him not putting it over to the extent as it should have been put over. Um, and I get it. Cornette is very passionate about what he does. And, uh, I, you know, I love him for that. Um, but it lit a fire under Cornette's ass. And I just remember it was right outside the gorilla position. Um, there's a room before the grill position. Then we were in the office and they were right outside that door. And, and Cornette was just, lacing into him bah, 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 and he just smacked the shit out of him smacked the shit out of him. and we were <laughs> we were just like sitting there like holy shit he just and and i'll tell you santino just ate it and just looked at him just ate it and just was like i was like man i see he's got some restraint uh because i mean santino could have just very easily snapped him in two but uh but jim Cornette wouldn't have cared because that's jim Cornette. he's crazy and i love him for it yeah, what's going through your head when you see that? Are you like, should I try and stop this or? <laughs> Fuck no! <laughs> Fuck no! Hell no! I'm the mind of my business. That's that's uh, that's one of the bosses doing what he's doing. I, you know, to an amateur guy, you know, I'm just like, I'm I'm out. I'm 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 just, I'm just doing my thing. I'm just, I remember we were all just sitting there and watching. We were, we were just like, but we were like, when he slapped the shit out like that, we were like. Oh, we just kind of like looked at each other and went, holy shit, that just happened. So, yeah. Was, was he gone the next day or was Jim Cornette around a bit after that? No, he's still around. He's still around for a bit. You know, it was funny because, you know, he was in and out a couple of times and and we had, uh, you know, different trainers. And then, and then of course, Paul Hammond came in and, and then there was a time where it was 
Paul Heyman and Cornette working together. And then it was just, uh, you know, uh, you know, just one of the, uh, just one of the, uh, you know, things where, you know, it was both of them going together. So I just saw one of the uh, guys comments saying that I was one of the cool guys. Damn right. I was one of the cool guys, big pal. Damn right. But anyway, um, but yeah, so. Good storytelling yeah. memory too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a, there's a ton of stories in that business. And, you know, I just had the, the, uh, I had the fortune of being able to, to not only just like be part of that family and meet so many people, but be cra- be crafted and shaped and, 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 uh, learn from some amazing people like, uh, you know, R- Rip Rogers was the first person that had, you know, was the main trainer when I was there. And then yeah, guys, and then Lance Storm came for a good bit of time and he brought a whole different like flavor to it. Um, and he was amazing and an awesome dude and so smooth. Um, and then, um, and then you had, and then you had Al Snow come and he brought something else. I mean, and then you had all the people coming from the WWE coming down and helping and, and, uh, you know, so many people brought so many things to that, to that, to that place that it was, it was one of the best times of my life. And, um, I, I, the amount that I learned there and the amount of respect I gained towards, towards so many people and, and the love, uh, was just awesome. You know, it was, it was like incredible, incredible. Well, I appreciate you coming on and maybe we'll have to have you back again. Cause I know there's a lot, uh, more that's probably not out there about you. This is a quick one though from a fan. I don't recognize this. Did you have another name? Tank Malachi? Yeah. Uh not not that I know of. I mean, you know, I I, I only know one tank, and that's me. And uh, there ain't nobody like me but me in the in the famous words of Ratchet Raccoon from Guardians of the Galaxy. Well, Tank Abbott had something to say about that. Ah, Tank. (laughs) Tank. That would have been a better tag team partner for you. I would have taken him. Yeah, shit. I would have taken a mop. So is there anything you want to plug uh, before we go here? And what are you up to these days? I know you're Um, you're still wrestling a bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm going to be doing some more shows coming up. I have a – actually, I have a couple appearances I just booked – shoot uh may 26th in baltimore i can't remember that i don't know i don't know the venue and then another one in september i don't know a couple others but uh yeah i mean basically i do custom apparel that's one of my, my companies uh apex custom um i do like custom apparel like i do gear for the guys uh the boys uh with t-shirts or whatever uh, schools, gyms, you know, all that stuff. So any kind of custom apparel I do. Um, and then uh, that's pretty much it. And getting into doing more voiceover work and stuff, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I can see you have uh, quite a studio set up over there. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, some of the some of the stuff that goes into it all, doing doing a channel and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is another quick one. Did yeah, you like sure. your entrance music? I hated it. <laughs> I hated <laughs> it. Oh, my God. It was so freaking generic. I mean, like, you know, you got all these guys who got this freaking awesome music. And I get it. You got to earn You got to earn it to have a badass song sometimes. But, but man, it's just like, like, first off, the music did not fit with the Dick's vibe. I mean, we're supposed to be Chippendale – wrestlers and you're coming out to it's like i was like come on man we got it i wanted to my whole vision real quick was just to be more like a um like a uh like a ravishing rick rude meets val venus type of flavor um you know type of type of character and um it be kind of smooth and but but funny and and i don't know just a lot more and that you couldn't do on smackdown unfortunately and i i told stephanie my 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 worries with that so i was like you know being on smackdown you guys are trying to be family friendly right now the dicks it's going to be hard to to to, you know to make it because because i had a couple of my promos they let me write my promos luckily i was nice uh, they were nice enough to let me do that and they shot down a couple of them because they were too risque for tv and then when finally one would go through uh, it would go to the center truck and then they'd be like, oh, you guys got to recut it. You got to take this out of that. And, and so it was like the most watered down cheesy version of, you know, what could have tried to have been something cooler if we had done it on raw, 
you know, on cable television versus network. For sure. And I know you're on Facebook. Where can fans follow you? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Facebook. That's that's my main one right now. And then I have TikTok. Uh, I have a TikTok page as well. Um, so, I mean, just look up Tank Toll and you'll probably find me. Uh, you know, funny thing is I don't even know my own handle. So I don't even know if I'm Tank Tolan underscore Tank Tolan, whatever. But, you know, I, I'm not a huge social media guy. Uh, I need to get more into it, push myself a little bit more. But maybe it's maybe just because I'm old. Can we see a double bicep? Oof. They look pretty big. We still. So you got this one right here and then you got this brother right here. Not bad still for for an old man. Still going to get in the ring and whoop on some young guys. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I'll let you close this off with whatever you want to say to the fans. It's been uh, very interesting. Thanks a lot. No, I appreciate it. No, first off, I just want to say thank you for having me on, um, first and foremost. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I'm always happy to, you know, do an interview and, and talk about, uh, you know, the good old days and, and, uh, and, and all the fun things that, you know, I've done and had the opportunity to uh, accomplish. Um, and, you know, most importantly, I just want to say, you know, anyone that watched this, thank you very much. And to any fans that have ever <laughs> paid to watch me or just have watched me on TV or YouTube or wherever, um, I greatly appreciate you. Uh, a lot of people, uh, I think, in the business um, kind of take fans for granted. And I just think that, you know, they're the, the lifeblood of, of uh, you know, and have given me the opportunity to do what I've done. And I just love them so much because, uh, shit, I myself was a fan standing in line trying to, you know, meet Hulk Hogan and and, uh, and guys like that throughout the years. So, hey, I appreciate them more than they could possibly ever know. And I just love the business so much and, and the fans are a big part of that. So thank you. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss 